Who's ready for more Wisconsin history? You are, I'm assuming, because you're listening to a Wisconsin history podcast named Badgerland Journal Stories of Wisconsin. So if you don't want Wisconsin history, um, you came to the wrong place. But please stay, because you might find something really interesting. Like today, we're going to talk about the mob. So we're going to get into how the mob is connected to Wisconsin and spoiler alert. It's those dang people from Chicago. Like why are people from Chicago always coming up to Wisconsin and causing problems? I'm only kidding mildly, but I'm also not. No, I'm kidding. I love you, Uncle Mike. Uh, (laughs) No, you're not ruining things from Wisconsin. But a lot of the mobsters that would come up to Wisconsin are Chicago mobsters and gangsters. Um, so I do get to blame this on them because it really, it really is their fault bringing all of that rough housing and illegal activity to Wisconsin. God dang you. Anyways, <laughs> so actually in reality, the cause of the mob being so prevalent was the temperance movement. So for those of you who have forgotten your high school history class of what the temperance movement was, this is when people in the early part of the 20th century, kind of actually late 19th century, it's been going on for a while, really thought that the ills of all society was alcohol. They thought all of the issues plaguing the country could be traced back to alcohol. So they tried to ban alcohol in the United States. And they did so successfully with the passing of a constitutional amendment that lasted from 1920 to 1933. And this amendment stopped the sale, manufacture, and transportation of alcohol. So you'd think that maybe this was the end of alcohol in the United States. No, no one believed that. Uh, People were still going to drink. Americans were not going to stop drinking alcohol. The only difference is the people producing the alcohol and distributing it were no longer law-abiding citizens, manufacturers. No, it was the Chicago gangsters. (laughs) They filled this gap in the market. And some of the more famous Chicago gangsters that came up to Wisconsin every once in a while was Al Capone. Babyface Nelson, although he's kind of a bank robber, not exactly a gangster. But he did rob banks. I guess your definition, it depends on your definition of gangster. And then you have Pollock, Joe Saltis, and he actually gets kicked out of Chicago by Al Capone. And he's like, well, I'm going to just go up here in Wisconsin and see ya. But what really ha- would happen is they'd be running their gangster business in Chicago. And sometimes the law was getting a little bit too close, you know, putting on a little bit too much heat. And so these gangsters would just, you know, disappear for a little bit. They'd, you know, travel to northern Wisconsin, take in the beautiful landscape, go to more than a few brothels, as we will discuss, um, until things kind of died down. And then they went back to Chicago to their illegal operations. Al Capone actually had a home on Cranberry Lake where he used to fly in alcohol and unload it in the docks. The alcohol was coming from Canada. Those dang Canadians. Um, Saltis would actually, who operated speakeasies in Chicago, moved to Wisconsin and opened a resort on Barker's Lake Lodge. This included a nine-hole golf course, and I'm sure alcohol was served. Wisconsin was also known, also had an area known as the Devil's Triangle, and it made up Hurley and Hayward, Wisconsin, in addition to, you know, hell. And there's a lot of uh, rough lodging. It was not a very nice area at the time. There's a lot of speakeasy serving that nice alcohol, and then there's brothels, you know, to get your needs met. Don't do that. Find a nice girl or boy, settle down, have a family. You know, we don't, we don't endorse brothels here at Badgerland Journal. But Silver Street in Hurley uh, was covered in both of these. And in fact, they had tunnels connecting the buildings. So, you know, if you want to go from your brothel to your speakeasy, you don't have to go out into the winter air. You know, Wisconsin winters, they can be frigid. Instead, take the tunnel. We've made it easy for you. And actually in Hurley, Wisconsin, Al Capone stayed in what is now Don's Never Inn. 
So you can go, there's a whole tour. If you are super in to mobster history, there's like a bunch of different tours that you can go on. You can go and stay in some of these locations. It's a whole thing. Robert Capone, so Al Capone's brother, had actually been in prison for two years for tax evasion. He bought a bar in Mercer, Wisconsin that ran slot machines, and he lived there for the rest of his life. He died in 1974. And Jimmy Hoffa, who had ties to the mob and eventually disappeared, probably died. He was such a uh, consistent patron of the Jack-O-Lantern Lodge in Eagle River that when he disappeared and, like I said, probably was, you know, taken care of. Um, they actually searched the area around the woods of this lodge, hoping to find him. But we actually had a little shootout of our own from the Chicago mobsters, which is really what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about, you know, the raid on the Little Bohemia. And some of you are going, what are you talking about, Abby? Don't worry, I'm going to explain. But first, 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 I'm going to introduce you to our two main gangsters, outlaws, public enemy number one. If you've seen the movie, then you maybe know who I'm referencing here. I am referencing John Dillinger and Babyface Nelson. Babyface Nelson, whose real name was actually Lester Gillis, I don't know why you changed it to Nelson. I don't know. But he had the baby face because he had a very boyish looking face. But don't let that deceive you because he's really not a nice guy. He grew up in Chicago and when he was a young boy, he started stealing cars, kind of rose his way up on the level of crimes to robbing banks. He traveled the country doing illegal stuff. Until April 1934, when he went to Chicago to join the Dillinger gang. So as I mentioned before, John Dillinger, if you've seen the movie Public Enemy Number 1, that's Johnny Depp's character, but he was not Johnny Depp. He was indeed just a bank robber. Um, but John Dillinger was actually born in Indiana. He also started off stealing cars, and I think he actually kind of gotten got hardened by the system like he okay so a little background on john dillinger because unlike babyface nelson we'll talk about babyface nelson real bad guy i mean both of them were bank robbers but john dillinger was usually seen as a pretty likable guy very polite and he like i said was stealing cars he tried to commit a robbery and his dad he was arrested for this his dad convinced him like hey just admit to what you've done He'll get off easier, you know. And so he took his advice, admitted to the crime, and he got, I believe, over 10 years in prison versus the person he committed the crime with, denied everything, and got off scot-free. And so in jail, I think he really kind of grew to dislike the justice system so much that as soon as he got out, he went right to robbing banks and became so prominent um, <laughs> that Babyface Nelson would join his gang, at least for a little while. Dillinger's gang would end up killing 10 different men, wounding seven others, and staged three different jailbreaks. So they were pretty successful. Dillinger himself, I believe, is only uh, responsible for one of those deaths, not to excuse what he did. But the public really liked John Dillinger. Because during this is happening during the Great Depression, people are struggling. And so there's a little bit of like, yeah, stick it to the man! Um, going on. So Babyface Nelson goes up, joins with Dillinger's gang in Chicago. And actually, after the raid on Little Bohemia, they will eventually part ways, partially because Dillinger thought that Babyface Nelson, his temper was too violent. He didn't want to rob banks with him. Um, again, kind of going to he had an ethical code, even though he didn't have an ethical code. And also around this time, Dillinger had actually been wounded in St. Paul, Minnesota by the FBI in April of 1934. And during the same same close encounter, his girlfriend at the time, Billy Frechetta, um, was actually taken into custody. She actually grew up on the Menominee Indian Reservation. So another connection right there to Wisconsin history. 
So there are some reports that Dillinger was given the suggestion of going and hiding in the North Woods by the owner of their favorite tavern in Chicago, which kind of spurred them to go to this little Bohemia resort. So before we get into what happens when Dillinger and his friends come to Wisconsin, we're going to talk a little bit about Little Bohemia and how it came to be and the people who are running it. So it starts with Nan Laporte, who grew up in Wisconsin. She would meet her eventual husband, Emil Wanaka, after helping with her brother's moonshine business. So yes, moonshine at this time would also be illegal, but that didn't stop them. So, you know, fell in love, got married, the whole shebang. And Emil purchased the land to build Little Bohemia in 1929 in Manitowish waters. When they were married, they actually at one point ran a bar in Chicago. It was the favorite of the mob and they would return to Manitowish, Wisconsin in 1931 to run the lodge. I will loop around back to these connections to the mob um, because their story of how everything goes down, um, they like to play the innocent victims. You know, they had no idea what was going on. Um, And there's a little bit of questions of whether or not that was true or not. So on Friday, April 20th, 1934, the first of the Dillinger gang arrives to, to Little Bohemia. Emil will go out and greet what we now know is Homer Van Meter, Marie Comporti, and Pat Riley. Marie is actually Van Meter's girlfriend at the time, and we'll see that a lot of the gangsters brought their girlfriends up with them for their, you know, Wisconsin getaway. And Van Meter's job is really to make sure everything was clear, nothing was real weird going on at the lodge, maybe scouted out a little bit before Dillinger showed up. So he walked up and says, hello, Emil. So already knows his first name. And then asks if the lodge is serving lunch, which Emil replies, yes, it is, and welcomes them inside. Once inside, Van Meter asks him if he has room for 10 guests. Emil once again replies, yes, I do. And Emil sets out about getting them settled. So George Bazos and Frank Trobe, Trobe, um, two employees at the lodge, carried up their luggage. George will actually make the comment that one of the suitcases it feels so heavy that he thinks it's filled with lead, in which Emil replies to mind his own business. So like I said, Emil, I think from the start, knew something was maybe a little bit up, maybe knew a little bit more than he wanted to admit. And so the guests started playing the slot machines, played with the dogs while they waited for Dillinger. So at 5 p.m., John Dillinger shows up with the rest of the gang. So John Hamilton, Pat Charrington, Tommy Carroll, Jean Delaney, who is Tommy Carroll's wife, Babyface Nelson, and his wife, Helen Gillis, all show up. All the guests are recorded as being very well-dressed, very polite, maybe save for Babyface Nelson. We'll talk about that. He's just a very standoffish guy, not someone you want to meet in a dark alley. But an hour later, they're settling in. They're eating dinner. Everything seems pretty good. So as they are unpacking, getting settled in, some of them went for a walk. Likely at this time, they are plotting an escape route. They know that the law they are wanted by the law, And they want to make sure that they can leave in a timely fashion. They do find that the only entrance or exit to the lodge is the main entrance, which is somewhat of a liability because it makes getting away harder. It's decided then that if they need to escape, they're actually going to escape along the shore of the bank. Although Babyface Nelson, not super in love with this idea. He does not follow what the rest of the group does. So then the group settles in after dinner, after scouting an escape route, they begin to play poker. Emil sits down and starts to play for a little bit until he claims the stakes gets way too high. And we'll find out later that Emil really can't be affording to lose a bunch of money, at least currently. So during this, Dillinger at one point reaches over to grab his winnings and he sees, Emil sees, 
him carrying two 45 automatics under his coat. This is what he claims later. He's either embellishing this or possibly confusing it. Dillinger actually was known for carrying a 38 revolver, um, not a 45 automatic. Uh, the other thing is 45 automatics are not popular in the 1930s. Like the police are carrying revolvers. It's very unlikely this is what Dillinger was carrying, but it is very possible that Babyface Nelson was carrying two 45 automatics. Either way, Emil will claim that this is when he started to grow suspicious of these guests. Guests. And so he went into the back after leaving the poker game, started shuffling through old newspapers, and to his amazement, John Dillinger was staying in his lodge. He saw it in the newspaper. The John Dillinger right there in the newspaper, that guy sitting at his poker taper table, John Dillinger. And so Emil says that, you know, he can't sleep and, you know, tossing and turning. And then when he arose, Tommy Carroll was already outside, already scouting things like he didn't go to sleep either. And so Carol says, you know, I slept really well. You know, are you serving breakfast? And Emil goes, yeah, yeah, I'm serving breakfast to a bunch of gangsters. Oh. <laughs> so then during breakfast, Emil will actually confront Dillinger saying, you know, I know who, who you are. I don't want any trouble. You know, my family's here. I don't want my property damaged, whatever. Dillinger, very polite, assures him there will be no trouble. They just want to want a place to rest for a few days, you know. And so Dillinger seems pretty relaxed about the whole thing, but the rest of the gang is very paranoid. They're listening in on calls that Emil is making. They want to know who guests are when they arrive. Does Emil know them? Can they be trusted? And so Dillinger, kind of trying to ease the tension, asks if Emil has a gun, because that's what you do to ease tension. Ask if someone has a gun. But Emil replies, yes, he does. He has a 22 rifle. And the men go outside and proceed to shoot at tin, tin cans, which, you know, I can at least appreciate uh, passing the time by shooting a 22. I can understand that. I just, if I'm trying to calm someone down, I don't think I'd go, hey, do you got a 22? Anyways, um, they did this until his 22 rifle jammed, and then Dillinger actually asked Van Meter to go and get a rifle out of his car so they could continue shooting. So Dillinger was not the only one that was interacting with the family. Eight-year-old Emil Jr. actually would remember playing catch with one of the men, and he remembers that he stopped playing catch because the man was very aggressive. Like, you remember his his hand stinging because of how hard this man was throwing catch and, like, he wouldn't stop. He was very aggressive. Out of all of the men I've mentioned, take a guess and which one I'm going to refer to. That's right! It's Babyface Nelson! Very aggressive. Even when playing uh, catch with, with a eight-year-old boy. But I will give it to Emil Jr., that's gotta be a great icebreaker. Like, hi, you know, my name's Emil. Yeah, fun fact about me. You know that uh, bank robber, Babyface Nelson? Yeah, you know at one point he was public enemy number one. Yeah. I played catch with him once. Like, no one can beat that. Nobody. So at this point, his mom has been informed. So Nan has been informed that this is Dillinger's gang. These are a bunch of, you know, criminals. She wants to take a meal and bring her, bring him to his cousin's birthday party at her brother George Laporte's house. And she did this for a couple reasons. Like, first, I'm sure she wanted to get away from all of the criminals. But also, she wanted to ask advice from her family on what they should do with, you know, ten criminals staying at their lodge. So she goes up to Dillinger and asks him, explaining, like, hey, my son already had this pre, pre-planned birthday party. Is it okay if I take him? And Dillager's like, yeah, that's fine. And actually, all three women that are in the group, so the different wives and girlfriends, even go, oh, we'll, like, do some cooking and cleaning while you're gone, so you don't have to worry about that. However, she is followed into town by one of the criminals. You know, gotta make sure everything is checking out. So during the visit, she actually stops and picks up her brother, Lloyd Laporte. And while they're there, she ends up mailing a letter to the assistant director, 
assistant district attorney in Chicago, George Fisher, in which she discloses that Dillinger was at the lodge in the letter. She also went to the party, told Henry Voss, who is who is her brother-in-law. So her sister married Henry Voss. And then George Laporte, her brother. And they come up with this plan for Voss to call the Milwaukee police on Sunday if her other brother, Lloyd, is given a pack of cigarettes in the morning of Sunday, on Sunday morning, by a meal. This all seems very, uh elaborate like i don't know why you wouldn't just call the cops you know right away so if this had not come to fruition if they'd not gone to the police uh, i would not really have that good of a story to tell you so obviously this occurs the pack of cigarettes is given to uh lloyd by a meal so then henry voss will then drive 60 miles in order to avoid anyone picking up on the suspicious activity to make the phone call he will call the milwaukee police which I think is kind of funny because I believe this is happening, like I said, in northern Wisconsin. Give me a second minute to wash waters. All right, so where is man to wash? Because, you know, I am running a Wisconsin history podcast, but I don't always know where stuff is. Yeah, this is full on in northern Wisconsin near the border. Um, So I think it's funny that Milwaukee police is the closest that you're gonna come to. You'd think you might call someone closer, although I'm sure like all of the other like police in the area are from like small towns. I don't know how many resources they have. But anyway, so he calls the Milwaukee Police Department. And they're like, yeah, yeah, you should probably call special agent Melvin Purvis of the FBI he would like to know because he's been trying to track down John Dillinger for a while. Around the same time, you have the two Pats. So Pat Riley and Pat Charrington, both are driving to St. Paul to drive or to pick up $25,000 from a nightclub owner. This comes back later because they will arrive back at an inopportune time. So once Melvin gets the report that Dillinger is in northern Wisconsin, he's like, he is mine! And so he chartered two airplanes for the Rhinelander Airport, um, and he wanted Voss to meet him there. And they started summoning agents from all over the area to help with this raid. Dillinger, on an unrelated note, decides he's going to leave early. And he was actually known for this. It helped him to keep the police off of his back by being very unpredictable, even when he'd planned something, changing the plans last minute. And so this threw a wrench in Nan's plan as she's sitting here going, oh, no. So they're leaving. And I already told my sister's husband, you know, Henry, that... So then she, like, brings her sister into the kitchen to try and be like, hey, there's a change of plans. You need to get to your husband. You need to, like, let him know that, like, they're not staying here as long as we thought they were going to be able to. So Mrs. Voss, her sister, is informed of this, and she leaves immediately. She hightails it out of there to then drive to Rhinelander Airport to meet her husband and the FBI to tell them what is occurring. And the agents actually end up getting delayed because when they get to the airport, they only have one car. It's hard to do an FBI raid with only one car. So then they start sending FBI agents to go track down another car, and which they eventually track down four more. So they end up leaving the airport at 7 p.m. They're not going to be there for another, like, couple hours. And so in this rush of, like, trying to find cars... Henry Voss is trying to, like, hastily draw a map, but he kind of neglects key details, like the presence of dogs, like the fact that there's kind of, like, a ravine by the lake that makes it easy for people to, you know, like, sneak around. And, you know, there's other issues happening, like, two of them now, five cars breaks down on their way there. But they finally make it to Little Bohemia. And the agents block the entrance with their cars and then start to proceed in by foot. But Nan's two watchdogs start barking. You know, 
They're good watchdogs. They see these guys coming, they're like, who are you? We must alert our owner. And this actually doesn't set off any alarms by the mobsters, gangsters, criminals. They're like, whatever. We hear the dogs, but like there's a lot of people around. They could be barking at anything. They could be barking at a squirrel for all we know. However, at this time, you have three men, John Morris and Eugene, Eugene Boisenid, um, who are two members of the Civilian Conservation Corporation. So for those of you who have no idea what that is, this is a New Deal program. Because remember, 1934, you are in the middle of the Great Depression. People are out of work. So they're probably doing things, kind of helping with different infrastructure around the area. And they were joined by a salesman named John Hoffman. And so they will finish their dinner. They're leaving, like they're about to leave the lodge. They might not have been staying there. They probably were just there for dinner. Get into their car and they're carrying rifles because again, you're in the middle of the woods. I'm sure this is probably a normal occurrence. The FBI sees these three men and they also see two of the gang members who are outside who are kind of like following around them. The men get in the car, start driving out. They have their radio like blasting. And so the FBI allegedly, allegedly, um, shout out them to stop, to halt, which they don't because they can't hear. And so the FBI opens fire. Morris is going to stumble out and he will make it all the way back to the kitchen Hoffman will also flee into the woods with his wound. Um, Eugene, poor Eugene, um, he dies. So, so far, the FBI has zero gangsters, two hurt civilians, and one dead civilian. Uh, the FBI, at least according to the FBI website, there is machine gun fire coming from the top of the Little Bohemia Resort. No other witnesses confirm this. In fact, there is many who claim that the criminals don't actually return fire. Like, these gangsters never return fire. They're too concerned with getting out or covering. But the FBI, because they're known for their truthfulness and, you know, always, always going for the criminals, never having those civilian casualties. I bet the FBI is going to listen to this podcast after. They're like, she's talking too much about us. Not in a nice manner. So the shots are what alerts Dillinger to the FBI's presence. He then rushes to turn off all of the lights. He grabs money and weapons, and he is fleeing. So Emil takes cover in the basement with the three women that are part of this. Um, Bazos and Traub also took cover in the basement. And so the lodge is surrounded. Like I said, this is occurring April 23rd, 1934. And they pretty much, the FBI just opens fire. They are just continuously shooting anything and everything. Not sure they really have that many targets. Um, Because you have, so some will flee out the back. But then you also have the two Pats. Do you remember them? I told you they were going to St. Paul, Minnesota. Well, they returned right as this is occurring. So they're pulling up only to be blocked by the FBI. And with some quick thinking, they're able to back out, turn off the lights, and get out of Dodge. And so they just head back to St. Paul. They're like, this was a bad idea. We should have stayed in St. Paul. So Dillinger, Van Meter, and Hamilton, they will escape out the back. Some say they jumped out a window. There's questions if that actually occurred. But they will slide down the bank of the shore and head north until they hit Highway 51. Dillinger, very nice. Very polite. Like, he's very polite during all of the, uh, all while committing crimes. So they attempt to steal a Model T from an elderly couple. Uh, and then they went, yeah, that doesn't run. Like, we'd give you the keys, but, like, it's not running. And so he said, what about that other car I see? And they're like, yeah, you know, that that's that's the neighbor's car. So he went, went over there and said, hey, we need to bring this old lady to the hospital. Can we have your car? And he's like, wait, what's going on? And then he, like, pointed a gun and was like, yeah, car, thanks. And he left them all. Everyone was fine. They made their way to St. Paul to meet up with the two Pats. Babyface Nelson is not leaving without a fight. He is the only one that exchanges gunfire and therefore is the last to leave. So like I said, there is accounts for the most part. The gangsters were not returning fire. If there's anyone who was, it was Babyface Nelson. So after shooting back, he will escape into the woods. 
and he goes through the marsh and then he finds the cottage of Ali Catfish. He is a member of the Ojibwe tribe or Chippewa, whatever the preferential name is. I will figure that out at some point. But he is a man living in this cottage with his family. He said that Nelson was a very small man, spoke like a child, not that intelligent, uh, but very mean. And so he held Ollie Catfish and his family hostage for three days. And when he ran out of food, he went into town with Catfish where he stole a car. And while they were getting out of town, he kicked Catfish out of the moving car and told him if he told anyone what had occurred, he would kill him. And then Catfish got out of the car and then shrugged and went, well, what's he going to do? So he went back and told, told the authorities what had happened. While he was with the Catfishes, Nelson kept a gun under his pillow at all times, trying to keep them in line. Um, this cabin is now part of Dillman's Bay Resort, cabin number five. He will eventually flee again to, I believe, Minnesota. All of the important people have left. Dillinger, Babyface Nelson, you got some of the women, although I feel like the women, while could be charged with, you know, conspiracy, they're not the ones usually robbing the banks. So I don't know how successful you could count this. But pretty much the FBI and Melvin just sat in the driveway thinking they had Dillinger trapped. There was no way out. And when they went in, he was gone. And this was highly embarrassing to the FBI and J. Edgar Hoover. Hoover was not happy about this whole incident. But eventually, as the FBI is firing at the lodge, someone finally yelled, like, stop shooting and we will come out. And so Emil, Bezos, and Traub um, all come out of the basement, followed by John Morris. It is said that the women actually left the building, like, at a different time. Like, there must have been a ceasefire, like, send out the women. And then we'll fire on you again. I don't know why they didn't all just come out at the same time. But the women at this time are arrested. Like I said, um, some will be released later. So, in the aftermath of this, um, Little Bohemia does not reopen because it is bullet-ridden. But today, you can actually go and eat at Little Bohemia and visit the small museum that is, that's in the room Dillinger stayed in. And this is because when Dillinger's game left, gang left, they left a lot of their belongings because they were hightailing it out of there. And so they were actually able to open a museum, which at one point was run by John Dillinger's father and sister. Their slogan now is Dillinger only left because he had to. You know, FBI was shooting at him. But the kind of the argument that, hey, we are a great resort. He wouldn't have left here if the FBI wasn't hot on his trail. The Wantakas um, would later claim that the outlaws were very unfriendly, very mean looking, even though, like I said, there's multiple accounts of Dillinger being very polite. Now, before we end this story and I tell you the fates of Dillinger and his gang, which I'm going to be honest is not the best, um... <laughs> I'm going to tell you about some fun coincidences. Um, like Emile's legal counsel when he's running this lodge. Uh, na a person named Louise Piquette. Who just so happened. Coincidentally. Completely unconnected. Um, was an attorney for John Dillinger. You know. Just like I said. A little coincidence. Um, so it's very likely Dillinger actually knew of this connection that his lawyer had mentioned, like, hey, you know, I helped this guy out in northern Wisconsin named Emil, runs this lodge in Little Bohemia, probably be a good place to, like, lay low. And we know that this would not be Louis, <laughs> Louis's only kind of gray area of operation, as in he had provided Dillinger with a wooden gun during one of his Crown Point escape. He also arranged several other hideouts for other people who were on the run. And he's actually even the one who uh, arranged for a doctor to perform plastic surgery on Dillinger at one point. Yeah, so like, this lawyer, not really on the up and up. And Piquette was actually eventually disbarred when it was revealed that he was harboring Homer Van Meter as a one of those gang members from Dillinger's gang. 
yeah. So like I said, not really in the up and up. The other thing I mentioned earlier, Emil was in a little bit of financial trouble. He was uh, struggling to pay the mortgage on the Little Bohemia Lodge. And so there's a couple things probably going on here. Dillinger was offering to pay him $500 for three days rent. But then you're sitting here going like, Abby, why would Emil then turn over Dillinger if he's willing to pay him so much money for so few rooms, so, for so few days? Well, after he was paid is when Nan goes and helps, like, starts to try and contact the FBI because uh, the war reward at the time for Dillinger's arrest was uh, $10,000. Also probably would have gone to helping him with that mortgage. So I'm just saying, I don't know for sure, but there's a chance, especially if we look at the family's kind of history of bootlegging, being in contact with gangsters in Chicago and they ran that bar, having the same legal counsel as John Dillinger, there's a chance that this family knew more than they were letting on and that they may have just turned him over for convenience. But finally, what happens? You know, what happens to Dillinger and his gang? John Dillinger, during the summer, eventually returns to Chicago where he is seeing a movie at a Biograph theater. As he's walking out, he is shot dead by the FBI. Great way to spend the summer. John Hamilton will be shot by police in, police in Hastings, Minnesota. Tommy Carroll, who will be killed in Waterloo, Iowa. Van Meter is killed by the police in St. Paul that August. And Babyface who becomes public enemy number one after the death of Dillinger, dies in November in a shootout on, on an Illinois highway. So the moral of this story is do not be a Chicago gangster or bank robber because um, there's a very good chance you'll end up dead. And that brings us to the end of our story. So I want you guys to let me know what you guys think. Did you know any of these outlaw connections to Wisconsin? Did you know about Little Bohemia? Would you go and stay at any of these different places that once housed mobsters? You can let me know a couple of different ways. You could, you know, leave a comment on one of my posts on my Facebook page at Badgerland Journal Stories of Wisconsin. You could also leave it on an Instagram post at Badgerland Journal. Or you can send me an email does anyone even use email these days? I do, which I guess is why I have one. So you could leave me an email at badgerlandjournal at gmail.com. And you know, it doesn't really even just have to be about this episode. You could leave me suggestions. You could tell me how much you love me. You could tell me how much you hate me singing at the beginning of this intro and to never do that again. But you should do something. You should leave some sort of comment. Share with your family. Give it to everyone. Expand your knowledge on Wisconsin history. All right, I'll stop talking. But this has been Badgerland Journal Stories of Wisconsin. I am Abby Alcox, and we will see you next time.